importance of uh, um, recidivism. The, co the whole conference was about how to fight recidivism. And of course, most of the delegation from Eastern Europe was proposing more severe punishment, put people for a longer, for a longer time in prison. And Niels Christie stood up and said, well, but listen, guys, if we put somebody to prison for some time, and he's going out and committing crime again, shouldn't we put him for a shorter period of time since we didn't manage to do a good job during the longer time? And since we know that the most important part of the time is the first time when it's a shock, well, the, each time it should be shorter. Of course, the reaction was that the Bulgarian delegation stood up and left the conference. But, uh, but this was how I met Niels Christie, and I think that partly also because of that, I had this great privilege. And at that time, I really needed a support also to go for the first conference, which was in, uh, Hang in, in Vienna in 1980. And I remember really, uh, it's... It's like yesterday. It was William Chambliss, an American professor, who also passed recently. And he was talking about the drug issue that I will be talking a bit today. But it, it was the, the things which for me was just incredible was not only the fact that he explained why you can make money on drugs which are forbidden, how the state can have a lot of money that does not go through revenue, so the money can be used for all purposes that is good for those who are in power at the moment. But also what was incredible was the names and facts and elements. And my problem was, how is it possible that the guy is speaking like that, very, making very clear that the whole business is crooked? that the government is crooked, that they are doing illegal stuff. Now, how is it possible that he's in the United States, he's a teacher, he is not put into a psychiatric institution, he's not <laughs> killed, and he can walk freely in the streets? Well, later on I realized that part, part of the truth is that both in West and in East, if I can still for a moment use those terms, people are not very much um, taking into consideration what scientists are talking about. But, but uh, it was really extremely impressive, and I must say the Americans had that, because Hal Papinski, many, many years later, yes, he, he did the same. I mean, he was able to recall all those names who were involved in this triangle of doing businesses with, uh, with drugs. Can I go ahead now with what I'm supposed to talk about? Can I start? <laughs> All right. So now turning to, to what I prepared for today, which is Modern Faces of Suitable Enemies. And of course, the, the title refers to what Niels Christie was doing. But the whole things that I want to do is about to find out the answer for the question, how does the thing start? And is it any chance to opposed to the processes which might be negative. Because if you see the title of the whole conference, Social Divisions, Surveillance and Security State, it doesn't sound nice. It doesn't start, sound in a, in a way that we're talking about the secure state, the state that offers security in a sense of a good quality life and we would like to have it. I mean, after 25 years of living in a new world, at least for those people who are from the Eastern part, but also because of European Union and also because of human rights that are developed, this recalls, reminds me of a joke, which becomes to a bitter joke. There is a lady coming to the tourist office and asking for a place she would like to go for a holiday, and she wants to have a place which is peaceful and happy. And getting many offers, she's saying no, no, so the guy is giving her a globe and is saying, choose. And she's looking at this globe and is saying, well, could you please give me another globe, or at least a globe from a yesterday? Well, the truth is, no, we are staying with this globe for, and there is no other globe. And in addition, I think that what Wisława Szymborska was saying is so 
so true that nothing can ever happen twice and so the sorry fact is that we arrive here improvised and leave without the chance to practice. Even if there is no one dumber, if you're the planet's biggest dance, you can't repeat the class in summer. This course is only given once. No day copies yesterday. No two nights will teach what pleases in precisely the same way with exactly the same kisses. So that looks as there is no way, but maybe there are some because we still look for patterns. And those patterns, if you go into Niels Christie, and one of the things that he is very much uh, recall with, and he himself was talking that his whole life was just efforts to respond to one question. What is crime? He was sure that crime does not exist. And I think that this, this idea is a very important one for us. But he was also doing the work which shows where all this are starting, where the bad things are starting, where the problems that we have are starting as far as the surveillance and the practice which are in the title of the conference. And for me, the, the very important three books of him is this first one from still 50s, Fange, Voktere i Concentration Leire, which is about guards in concentration camps in Norway, where he's asking the question, how come young guy manage, Norwegian guy, nice guys, good guys, manage to destroy, kill, annihilate hundreds of Yugoslavian people who were taken into the, this camp? A and this is the first question which is important, how it is happening that we treat somebody as not a human being. The other book that is dealing with this question is of course the book about the people who are abusing alcohol and who are made to work compulsory in forced labor. And then the third only work which was written together with Kettlebrun is this Den Gude Fiende book where he is developing the idea of suitable enemy. But of course, he's not the only one. And I have just probably not all of them, but these are the members of the European group who made a great part of the work and a big part of the thinking that we are having today and that we can based on. And this is Luke Hulsman, Karen Leander, Jock Young, Stanley Cohen, Lydia Zobler, Kettle Brun, Anna Eggert, Mary McIntosh, William Chambliss, Barbara Hudson. And the important thing is, these are not just academics. These are people who came to the group from having experience and sharing those experience from real life, managed to put patterns that help to change the things and develop the suitable enemies idea. The patterns that I, and I'm taking into consideration while preparing that lecture is the pattern of suitable enemy. If you know what are the elements, if you can hear and you can see the elements that are presented when the problem, social problem is presented, if you can spot that we are really talking about something that can be called suitable enemy, that helps in understanding what's going on and maybe solve it. But another idea which is here very important is also the idea of moral panics, which is the idea, I don't know who man made it, but it was developed very much by, by uh, Stanley Cohen. And together with this, there are two other elements which build up the know-how, if I can say so, of European group. And this is idea of globalization that we tend to treat as something negative, but I, I will try to show it that it might be also positive. But this is combined with Dinian Cavadino ideas of political diversification, which for me was very important and we will come in a second to it. These are the base, but then it should help us to recognize <coughs> where, where using the suitable enemy, when where using moral panics leads to, to what problems and to what social phenomenon it leads. Suitable enemies, just to make it short, it is uh, based on the, uh, 
Niels Christie and Kettle Brun, when they were talking about it, they treated it as really presentation for showing how the state is dealing with drugs, right? So they wrote in the preface to the book in 1984, this book has arisen from profound concern about the dominant perception of drugs in Scandinavian countries and the drug policy uh, that this perception leads to. So when Kettlebrun and Niels Christie were developing idea of um, uh, suitable enemies, they were really taking the element that was discussed, like drugs, for example, and they were looking at how the policy on drugs is created based on those elements of suitable enemies. That this is something that we dis despise, we hate it, and of course heroin, cocaine, these are very dangerous stuff, right? We don't think about dangerous stuff when we think about cigarettes and vodka, that's another stuff, right? But, and he was, they were doing also this distinction, but of course this this must look strong, but at the same time it's weak. What is drug? We decide. What is not? We decide. So you can be drugged like a hell in a hospital, so you can be drugged like a hell in prisons, but then it will be just called a medicine, not a drug. And in reality it is something that can be, yes, constructed the way it is necessary, and this is not clearly defined. For me, what was most important in the whole idea of suitable enemies is the fact that you can take as much money as you want from the public money, saying we need those money to fight drugs. In fact, we can use it and abuse it the way we want. But the, my point is, this is really, when it stays with Niels, when it stays with Kettlebrun, they were only talking about the fact that this is drugs and how the drugs are put into the public policy, that's where the suitable enemies stopped. I think that this is much more deeper and that it can be used broader because this might be just the beginning for something more. But of course there is also this moral panic idea with um, Stanley Cohen and the two things are related, although they are not the same. So the moral panic which we have recently, and you might give much more examples, and of course with suitable enemies as well. Suitable enemy, terrorists might be suitable enemy, right? Uh, the, the foreigners that are coming might be suitable enemy, but with moral panics that we faced, at least in my country, in Poland, was the pedophile. And this was a pedophile which was a tourist from United States that went as an idea to Scandinavian countries, then was visiting Central Europe, and then came to us. Of course it's a problem, but what we do with this problem, how we use it, and again how we abuse it, this is the point that is extremely important to see if we are getting a problem on a table that we have to deal with. We should think, is it a real problem or is someone trying to use this for totally another purposes? So all the time, I, I have no better word for what I think might going on. My idea is in different countries, this might look differently. In different countries, we can pick up a different subject in order to build up on suitable enemies census or concept or on moral panic concept. But I might not be right. I might not know enough what's going on in Ireland, what's going on in Lithuania, what's going on in England. So I might imagine that this is only us who are in this specific situation. But my point is that with suitable enemies and with moral panics, we are really taking the elements which sounds big. It's drugs, it's pedophile. But apart from that, I think that this is a time to look into things which, which sounds innocent, which are the concept that does not drag us and tear our attention and does not make us think, oh God, we have to deal with it. If this is something that concerns a bad, big criminals, 
we tend to think, yes, it's all right to do very severe things with them. If we want to put them apart, and if we want them put into prison forever, it's good, because they are dangerous. If the things is concerned about feminists and females, well, who cares, right? They are crazy. So again, if these are just the jokes, or if these are the language, or the statement that concern those crazy women, who cares? This is not such an important. And in addition, if someone is starting to talk about same-sex marriages and the rights of LGBT people, what the LGBT is, lesbian, these are lesbian and homosexual behind it. Well, who cares? They are parasites. They are a problem. They are not normal, right? So we're coming to a point where it's not a problem that is ours. We think that what's happened to those people who are on the edge of normality, they can, the, the reaction and the talks and the rules that we are preparing for them will never <coughs> affect us. This is not something that, that is affecting us. And the way I see it is that drugs is just the beginning. Pedophile is just the beginning. It's a big, big subject which make us be trained, adjust to the situation when we accept. We, and, and, and yes, and what do we accept, right? We accept that some rights that we think are for good and for us might be a little bit curved, might be a little bit narrowed, might be a little bit, well, but it's not for you, it's not against you, it's just against those few people. Apart from Niels Christie, Stanley Cohen, and others. There is also Naomi Wolf, feminist. Feminist woman from United States who wrote mostly about the Yes Means Yes, the book against um, rape, and wrote much about other stuff than really politics and policy. And this book that she wrote, The End of America in 2007, is quite exceptional because you can see that people get to some ideas for some reason, no matter where they are. You can be in a different country. You might not read Niels Christie. She probably did not read Niels Christie. I couldn't find any reference to Niels Christie in her book, not even to Stanley Cohen. But she also came to 10 points which helps you to destroy the, the elements of, sorry for those big words, but state of law and democracy. This, the place where the human being is valid and where you can be sure that it's your personal life, if it, even if it's not sacred, is secure. So you will not be, you not be treated badly just because somebody else has more power. And she is talking about 10 points. And within those 10 points, um, I'm from Poland in 1980, this was the country where the solidarity started and we treat these words as an important one. So for us, with the past of the secret prison, with the past of persecution of people and torture and secret killing, this would be impossible, impossible to accept and believe that number three, secret prison, could be done in this country. This could be impossible. So when the rumors started that in Poland, Americans set up a secret prison. I was one of the first ones to stood up and say, yes, we have to make everything to clear the things up because it's evidently a mistake. This is impossible. Well, uh, you know, it was such an important issue. Our freedom was on stake. The state of the whole world was on stake. And on the other hand, we're talking about terrorists. We're talking about big criminals. Well, why didn't you, inf why, why didn't you were informed about it? Well, that's for your good. You shouldn't know about it. This is a conversation that I'm having now in my country, which is after over 10 years of the whole things and the lost case in European Court of Human Rights. In Poland, in the country of solidarity, we accepted, and I'm saying we, 
and it is really we that I mean, although I am ridiculed by my friends, because they are saying that you had no chance, we had no chance. And my point is, yes, but they couldn't do it in the United States because they have the civil society strong enough not to accept it. They couldn't do it in Ireland because they have social society strong enough so they did not accept it. They didn't dare. They dared to do it in a country where Americans were saying, well, we cannot do it in our countries because it's forbidden, it's against the law. But Poland, Lithuania, Hungary, oh, heck with them. Well, they've got it in, on a paper, but it's on a paper. So to some extent, yes, it is also my responsibility that we didn't know about it because we didn't have the strong enough groups which could control what's going on. And we didn't have the um, atmosphere, the air, that would make the politicians think that, no, we cannot go into it. They were quite sure it will stay secret forever. So now you know that if two people know something, it never going to be secret. But she also is saying among those 10 things about two other stuff. Arbitrary detention, arbitrary. It's arbitrary. It's me who decide. There is something in the law, but it's me who decide, and I put in the law that it will be me who decides and subvert the rule of law. So I'm a lawyer. I'm a criminologist, but a lawyer as well. And I think that very often we put, we, we look into social social scenario, we look into processes, but we forget to take law into consideration, and that's what I want to take into consideration right now. This is Cavadino and Dinian, and I know that it's not well visible, but what they did, they did a genius stuff, and they did it only for several countries, and they did not include Eastern Europe, which doesn't matter, because we can do this work on our own, and the other countries can do it on our own. But what they said is that it is not an accident how many prisoners you have in your country. It is not an accident what kind of criminal policy you have. It is not an accident how far you are able to keep online with the human rights being protected and being respected. And they put, into, they put those countries into just four elements, neoliberal, conservative, corporatism, and Japan, which can be put apart. But the point is, depending on your economy, depending on your political situation, you have exclusion or inclusion present. So in the countries where the trust is very low and where you tend to see your neighbors as foreigner, as bad, you will probably end up with bigger number of prisoners and with more support for criminal policy being part of a, of a general policy and as a part of the policy which uh, is based on imprisonment. And of course, here there is no country of mine, and this is a very good exercise for my students usually, but I think that we were somewhere in conservative corporatism before under the previous regime, which I don't know how to, how should it be called, because it wasn't communism, it wasn't socialism, it wasn't anything like that. But the point is that after those changes, which were supposed to liberate people, we all went into the very neoliberal state. And with going into ne neoliberal state, we have to take into consideration that it's much more difficult to gain what Bauman is saying. <coughs> Globalization is the fact, but this globalization can be also the fact that, okay, we are all in European Union with the Convention of Human Rights and with European Union, uh, con not convention, but the basic rights of human rights, which are genius, right? So we could really do quite a lot to keep to that. We are not doing this as well. And there is a choice. And the choice is quite visible. The choice is that we can go into the legal situation where it's me who will decide who is a bad guy, or we can really keep into the situation where we understand that excess of power prevails 
where the excess of powers prevails, then there is no security. Then the, the whole things of surveillance, divisions, and security state is coming into presence. How to get into this Veriudes Bestimteish? I think that looking at those small things, first you have to try to break the load bearing wall. And those load bearing wall, I call the basics of a criminal law. The basic of a criminal law is nullum crimen sine lege. If there is no law, there is no crime. And you cannot go back. Lex retro non agit. You cannot persecute somebody for something that was not legally observed and present when that person was sentenced. If you have doubts, it goes on sight of the person who is under the persecution, and it is in dubio pro reo, and this is nebis in idem. You cannot punish twice the person for something that he, she did. These are basics. This is something like that there is night and day. And of course, during summer, the days are longer. During winter, the days are shorter. But nevertheless, it's not the night that is coming for 24 hours, for 12 months, all the time. So you don't touch this. Or you touch. And if you touch this, then probably all the rest can happen. But this is not enough. You need additional elements. Because in order to break nullum crimen sine lege, lex retro non agit in dubio, you have to find something. And I was giving you these examples. Does the feminists are stupid? Homosexual, well, <laughs> who will care about them? And the criminals? Criminals are a bad criminal. There is those very interesting book by David Livingstone, which is translating, what is the process? How to make the person inhuman? Because we have to make those persons inhuman first. We are animals. And we are social animals. So it says that in our mind and in our brain, we have a tendency to perceive a person not as an enemy, but as something that is we've got in common. We need each other. So in order to make the person non-person, you need something in addition. And it is not so difficult, because language makes a great things. So you do not call the person an inmate. You do not call, per, per, call the person a young man who made the terrible crime, or the terrible things, which we call crime, that he deserves a very severe punishment, and he should be punished. Once he finished his punishment, he should be relieved. Instead of this talk, we are giving you a talk this is a beast, this is a monster, this is inhuman person. And of course you do it under the authority of a big people. You need minister of justice, you need dean who will talk that way, you need people that have a standing, right? And who would explain that in these circumstances all those basics are not valid anymore. And of course this should be done into routine. So you make the law which tells you how to get new members of this inhuman group. In Poland, it starts just with one case. The guy, Mariusz T, and I fight for his Mariusz T and not for his full name because you have no right to give the full name of a prisoner. He has a right to keep his anonymity if the courts did not allow to put his name in a full name. And of course, this is a minister of justice who is getting in front of camera Minister of Justice, and who is saying, this guy is supposed to leave the prison. What we have to do? We cannot allow that. The guy killed four boys 30 years ago. He was sentenced four times to death penalty. He got four death penalty. But we changed the law. He, we could kill him four times. We did it. We changed the law. We could transfer this punishment into eternal imprisonment. We did it. We changed this law in a parliament to 25 years of imprisonment. His 25 years of imprisonment 
was the time when we were supposed to work with him in order to let him live peacefully. The truth is there is a lot of people like that in Polish prison. We choose him because four boys, and in addition we told this was on sexual, there was no sex in that, which does not change the fact that it was a horrible crime, but how it sounds good, right? Four boys, sexual abuse, pedophile, homosexual in addition, you've got all in one. So he was portrayed as a beast. And of course, being portrayed as a beast, he managed, this is a minister of justice, the guy who is responsible to keep the law on. Minister of justice, the whole parliament, and a president signed that all the four elements, there was no possibility to prolong his punishment. We did it. Lex retro non agit. We introduced this law in 2014. We did it. In dubio pro reo. We really don't know how this guy might behave in the present time in reality. Doesn't matter. Nebis in idem, don't punish twice. We did it. In addition, we did it with the even more serious punishment because this guy now is put into the place where he's sitting adusqua morte, if I can say so. It means that somebody else will decide if he can leave or not. But we are doing everything not to allow him to win. He's just getting uh, to, to, to got freedom. He's just getting another five years for possessing, for possessing in his cell. First, we, they tried to say that he is uh, um, eating other people which cannibals, first for cannibalism, but well, they found the two tooth. It was his tooth, so cannibalism fall down. So now it is for possessing, possessing pedophile materials, which are his photo put on the drawings, but it doesn't matter. Everything is secret. So you see that suddenly everything is possible. You don't need to keep by the law, but you still believe it is just for bad people. It is just for those who are the worst. Well, I must tell you, it's not so good. We just changed the law a year later. This year, two months ago, we have the law which now is for everybody. So anyone in Poland who will have any accident and get to any prison, don't do it. Because you might be moved into this pass which is on for those who have non-limited time in prison because you look unhealthy. Right? It's enough, really. So what was expected and what was supposed to be just for one person become a general rule. Well, we have the gender. It's hard to believe it, but it's true. Gender is something like a witch of the um, of several year, several several uh, centuries ago. So you've got bishops and you've got church who start the whole campaign and here is what I was saying I don't know if it is just my country or if it is a process but here we know that this is actually not just my countries because this is it starts in Germany in 2006 it went to Hungary in 2008 it is in Slovakia in 2011 it is in France in 2011 it came to Poland in 2012 it's actually not only Poland it is also Lithuania it is Croatia it is Serbia it is all those countries it's Romania and Bulgaria so you see that these are those countries but actually we did not have a long practice of law in order in a good sense of obey the human rights. And you do it in a simple way. You do it by ridicule the ideas and you call it that if you are a gender oriented, then this is like Nazism and communism combined. Those bishops are saying this straight from the church text and to TV and to radios. This is what is heard all over. This makes the big activities of, of politicians who think that they need the support of the church in order to gain and the order to win. But of course
course, behind that, it is what was in Ireland, what was in Germany, what was in other countries. There is church responsible for mistreating children. There is church responsible for mistreating money. What do you do with it? You start with a big voice. Who is responsible for pedophilia in church? Well, if you don't know, then the Bishop Michalik will tell you. Divorced parents, feminists fighting the traditional model of family, and gender ideology promoting homosexual behavior. And that is a tone. This is the language that is imposed and becomes the everyday practice. So it's not a big thing. It's not that we are solving problems of uh, pedophilia or that we are dealing in specific ways with drugs. This is those little invisible stuffs that becomes a major idea that allows the whole shift in the way of acting. And of course, this is the whole thing start with the U Council of Europe Convention, anti-violence anti convention, that is using those two words. First of, course, first of all, it is explaining what the gender is, that this is cultural way we treat male and female, and it says in Article 12, we, we are going towards promoting eradication of these customs and tradition. No one is taking away from you Christmas, Christmas carols and Eastern eggs, right? It's just those traditions that are based on inferiority of women and stereotype roles for women and men. It doesn't matter that we might explain that this is really something that is good for both women and men. It doesn't matter. The matter is to fight anything that is against something that in tradition is put as a division between male and female. And I think that's another thing that comes from Scandinavia, and this is Johan Galtung, who is showing that before we start, before we use the violence, before we start open hatred towards group of people or towards um, specific subject that is attacked, we should see what is invisible, what is really growing and what is the ground that is helping this on the top to blow out. And he's making this idea of cultural violence and structural violence, where this cultural violence is the language among the other things that we are using. And a structural violence goes into the law that we are creating. And once in the law, we are accepting the fact that we are not necessarily obliged to run by these very strict rules. That's where the direct violence can go. And the symbolic glue for, well, I call it rights and conservative because that's how it is. It is really was, starts with strict drug law. And the street drug law is so understandable. The good children of ours are on stake, right? Then it is denying prisoners the rights to the basic of the rule of law. Then it is denying women and men their reproductive rights. Not that obviously. We are saying children are needed. Children are saved. Children are sacred. This is the children. And our children are the most important. And of course, the same is with LGBT and their equal civil rights. The, the, the way of pattern of the discourse goes into fact that this is something that destroys the general good state of life that we have. And what starts with this care for family and country results is this is today that we have quite openly, right? Dzisiaj imigranci, jutro terroristi. Today immigrants, tomorrow terrorists. And it has a double sense. We accept today immigrants, and tomorrow we will have to accept terrorists. Well, that's one, but there's also another one. We accept immigrants, but in fact, they are terrorists. So it's not that this is the only things that are going on. You have a lot of positive activities. You have medical marijuana and fight for it and fight for not treating people badly just because they use marijuana and not drinking bottles of vodka, right? We have quite a strong movement toward the rights of LGBT community. We have quite a strong movement 
towards the equal rights of female and male, and I'm not only talking about Poland, I know that this is in the whole region, and there is also fight with those using the words which brings the human being into the sense of a parasite, but that one is the loudest and it has a voice. It has a voice through church, it has a voice through the weak, but nevertheless present political representation, and it has a and it has also the voice through the, it's easy. It, you don't need to think. It's easy just to accept it. And I think that the result of it that you can observe within the law, this is already within the law. Police provocation is legally accepted. And I'm not talking about agent provocateur, which is when we have a lot of evidence that someone is making illegal stuff, and we need this last one, right? We, we do the agent provocateur stuff. Not anymore. Now we will check if you are a decent person or not. We will try to check if you take the bribe or not. If you will use the car of the, for some other reason, or we will check you if you are moral or not, and we will prove you, you are not because that's what we are taking money for. We are not good really in finding the real crimes that are going on, and sometimes they are, right? We are not good in this, but we are good in producing problems and saying, look, he was supposed to be decent. Bagging wiretaps is dropping. This is coming back to the time when we were living in a communist era, and now I call it communist era, but it was not so developed technologically. Now technology went far, and you see, I had a mother, and my mother was uh, having a difficult life. So in times where we were in previous system, when she was saying, you have to be careful, don't talk, don't do it, they are listening. That was quite normal, because we really were living in such time. But after 89, when she was still saying the same thing, well, that was a sign that something is wrong with her. The point is, we are back. I see myself, well, don't talk. Well, better not use telephone, but better meet, and better go to park, right? We are back in this situation. Independent, transparent justice system is suspended. And this is really tragic because the whole system is based on a weak, fragile, but three elements. And once the judges are not feeling that they can judge as they feel like, and if we don't feel that the just judge is doing this job, it's done. And of course, I'm giving just the points, but these points are in the law, which allows all those things happen. And the fourth part is refugees are identified as terrorists, and slogan which would be impossible, impossible some years ago, now is something that is okay. Poland for Poles, just for Poles. And I know that this is not the slogan that you can hear only in my country, and I think that this puts the whole democratic open society on risk. So that's the bad picture, and I think that with the beginning of suitable enemy and with this moral panic, it's important to go down and see into those little elements, things that seems to be little, things that seems to be benign and not valid for our life, because that's where the process starts which adjust us. Well, that's, I don't want to finish with the negative elements. I want to finish with something that is positive. And this is the analysis of uh, Ronald Ingelhardt and Christian Veltel uh, in the book that is talking about wave of change. And it looks like there is a positive, the positive change is possible. So we are not at lost, but we need to think. We need really to fight strongly for equality between male and female first. We need that. We need that in order to understand that the whole action against LGBT community comes from not accepting that something else than patriarchy can exist. And we also need that to understand that this is not just female and male, but apart from that, there are people of different age, of different state of mental health and physical health, and there are people of different colors and different nationalities, and yes, they will come to us because to some extent, 
they are coming not because they love us so much, but because of the problems that we created in their countries. And there is something, the point where we have to admit it. And the other things that might help us is the conscious of being, uh, sorry for the big words, empathy. The more we will put ourselves in the foot of others, the better it is to see the person not as a beast and not as a monster, but as, as a fellow being. So in this book, there is a good prescription on how to get out from this hell that we are creating. I think that in addition, we need this in a way within the state of the law. Because as the Polish Wisława Szymborska poet is saying, something that to be continued is always based on what we already have. And we don't need to base it only on the negative, but we can really take from not only Niels Christie, but from the others who were publishing, doing work, and being part of this community of European group. Thank you very much. I think, coming back to Dinian and Cavadino, I think that we are growing on a different soil depending on where we are. And of course, culture will play a big role. But at the same time, we are in this global society where a lot of different elements of different cultural ideas are spreading and mixing and interflowing. So my my point would be that we are responsible for what is happening. My call would be, well, don't think that you cannot do anything. And of course, I'm not inviting anyone to go with big sticks on moon, uh, in a sense, to fight impossible fights and be a Don Quixote. But I think that lots of those, uh, lots of those bad things are happening for two reasons. First, we think that they are not important enough, so I'm not going to be involved in it. And second, it is that I think that I cannot do anything about it. I've, you see, uh, we had this uh, big political maneuvers, if I can use this word, to present our situation in Poland and the European Union as tragic and as in ruin. So Poland is in ruin, European Union is in ruin. And in fact, it was enough to have three women who started on the internet the mocking page, Poland in ruin and Europe in ruin, by putting lots of photographs which were showing beautiful buildings, beautiful parks, beautiful places, happy people, and join together saying, well, that's the ruin. That's the symbol of something that is wrong. And this was enough to have three people to change the, to change the way the politicians start to talk. They need a better arguments for what they want to achieve than just make people being afraid. So I think my, my call would be, yes, it is also your obligation. If you want to have a change, or if you want to have the human rights respected and other human beings treated in a human way, it is also by the example that we are setting up. Thank you. Um, I'm quite forward to what you It's quite empathetic. Uh, uh, but one thing that, that, that I, I, I thought was coming out is perhaps unintentional is the um, is idealization of the West. Particularly when you, um, um, you, you, you mention um, strong civil society, um, and, and meant that in the West um, did not have a Kulang or um, 
um, what you had in Poland. I, I was fortunate to visit Poland in the 80s before solidarity came out, so I can see what you talked about. But don't forget also that um, just less than 100 uh, miles from the US, that there was also Guantanamo. Okay. Of course, at, at, at this time, it's not citizens <coughs> that were, were locked up there. Well, of course, you know, there were allied citizens, but British citizens were, were kept there. And then, of course, in Britain, too, we had um, the time with, with the IRA campaign. Yeah. So um, you take America. Um, it, it, um, we're aware that uh, something like um, the, the American prison is full of African Americans, one out of every four um, um, young men and under 25 is in the American prison system. So uh, I'm just worried. I mean, I take the continent about Poland, but particularly um, this whole point about neoliberalism, because I, I think Bowman perhaps got it slightly wrong. Because neoliberalism is not only becoming global. Neoliberalism is key. Neoliberalism is God. Yes. And it's also been exported you know, to other countries, creating mayhem. Yes, particularly the, the, the economic aspect. I just thought I'd bring this point. Well, you, you are, of course, right. And uh, this is where I'm coming from. And the grass is always greener on the other side. Plus, you always, you are right. But then in my head is, if you are to have, well, yes, you are right. I, in this specific situation, you've got 40% of the inmates in the United States who are black with the 16% of the general population. And you will have like, I don't know how many here, but you will have in Hungary 40% of the population in prison who are of Roma origin, while they are just few percent in the country, not even probably 10, 11, right? That will be the most. Yes, uh, living in a country where the passport was impossible and when the free speech was impossible, you were looking into the other places. And in this respect, I think that United States, Great Britain, sorry guys, Germany, France are much more responsible for what's going on because it's not only me who is looking into those solutions. It is also my government who is saying, well, they are doing it. When I was describing the case of Marius Te and all the laws that we broke and we broke the basis, official discourse was the same is in Germany, the same is in England, the same is in France. We tend to back up our bad movements with the Western countries. And of course, you know, my first point is give me first good American quality of life, and then we will talk about prisons. No, we start with the other part, with the other side. We bring the worst, what might be in the United States, which is criminal policy, and we don't give it them for good quality. And of course, the truth is that even this good quality is not even a good quality anymore because of what's happening there. But in our head, yes, West is something good, and East is something Bad. And to such an extent that I have two daughters, and one daughter came back from England and is living in Poland, and the other daughter is living in France. And the daughter from Poland is talking to this daughter in France. Well, you don't understand it because you're living in the West. Like we would not be all of us in in the European Union. And the fact is, we are not all in the same European Union. And yes, you have. So this is when I'm talking about West. It's actually talking about idealized idea of something that is good, and that we thought is achieved there before we could experience it. But saying all that and loving Russian people and being very close to Russian culture, I would still prefer to deal with administration in the United States than with administration in Russia. And I would still feel more safe in the United States than in Russia, even when I understand and I like people. But, so this is where the line goes. But yes, 
I take your point. West is an idea. West is not what's going on in the United States. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Um, it's a really enjoyable opening um, uh, work to help us focus on what we're going to do. And I particularly appreciate helping with the song. Because <laughs> Thank you. Going in the wind, um, means that it's there, but it's recognizing what's coming down on the horizon. And I just wonder whether you'd say a few words of what academics can do. I mean, because we're in an institute of law and law, I normally find boring. But it's not, because people like um, uh, Gus Hussain talk about policy law. The idea that suddenly out of nowhere comes a policy that's complete, that's covering new powers of surveillance, uh, new ways of uh, interrogation. Or actually Niels Christie at the very beginning, the idea that there's industry there. We stopped calling it the police, the military industrial complex. We now call it the military, police, security, university, media, entertainment complex. <laughs> it's a mouthful, and it's the idea that we've got the freedom, or we thought we had as academics, to kind of open this up and challenge it. But most academics are pretty subservient, and we're not actually speaking out. So, I mean, the question, I guess, to open this all up, I know that Jürgen Johansson in uh, Norway is just starting a new journal of resistance studies, but I think uh, the question I've got to you is, what advice have you got for us to begin resistance to what's coming down? You already said it, actually. And you have to, you, you have to take it into consideration that Niels Christie, in recent time, was not the person that was nicely welcome with his uh, ideas and with his remarks and with his opinion on, on what's going on, even in Norway. So I think that the most difficult is to speak up and and I will tell you how to do it at least how I do it but I have I am 62 so maybe it's easier um, um, but Niels Christie we have a lot of program Norway is making giving a lot of money for good programs so we have a program with Norwegian Ministry of Justice our Ministry of Justice and one judge who was in, inviting me to this program asked me for the experts from Norway so of course the first person I mentioned was Niels Christie and he was the first one the Norway s struck out no no Niels Christie why because he is too radical, too crazy, his opinion are against the state, he's telling that we are becoming the neoliberal state well it's far way to go, but yes, these are the issues which are there. So I think that, um, you know, to, to wait, my position, my directorship, <coughs> my title, with what I'm going to say, and what, what I'm going still to write and publish, and be ridiculed for that. That's not easy. But I think that that's what we have to do for two reasons. We are in the most safe position. We still can talk. I've got, uh, in my faculty, it's not the neoliberal, it's Opus Dei who is now governing the whole things, really. This is Opus Dei. I think that very soon we will start with praying and uh, we will be very re religious. And to say, no, I'm not going to pray just because the religion should be private. No one should ask you what religion you are or if you are not religious. And the second thing is, sorry for saying that, I remember that I'm mortal and I'm going to die. So, after all, what a hell. It's not that much that we are putting on stake. Uh, just to be quite frank, if I'm afraid that they might make, make me trouble, yes, I am afraid. So then you have to make a choice. Okay, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is not really a question for you in a way, but it kind of comes out of some of the comments because, okay, we hear reference to the West, and you were very funny about that. People uh, talk about neoliberalism. People talk about globalization. You talked about, and other people have mentioned the state, right? 
one of the one of the kind of underneath this is one of the problems I have with Caribbean and right? Where's capital in all this? Right? Where is capital? Because these states, are capital states, right? So where is capital in not your story but our story about this? Because we talk as if it doesn't exist. And it's pretty central to neoliberalism. It's pretty central to globalization or vertical globalization. So I'm just wondering where it is in this story. We can we can kind of we can resist the state, we can talk about the state, and, and those things are very important. But where's capital in this? It's not it's kind of missing, right? But it's kind of important. It's with Indian and Cavadino. And it is also where it is, it's with your know-how. Uh, it's something that I'm aware that it should be taken into consideration. But, okay, short story. The reason why we have today problems that I'm talking about, and I might be wrong, but I think it is because of the capital that you're talking about. That we were only thinking about capital, but we forgot emotion. So, all we were all we wanted was to get into the capital state which become neoliberal and at this stage we told all the other people sorry old guys you are unimportant young guys who are not rich forget you have no chance well the people who are living before well you are from previous period it's not important and you left a whole globe of people who feel unimportant, misery, and without dignity. And this is the moment when priest Ridzik is coming, the guy who is got in empire and set up a radio, and set up a radio with, I will listen to you, come, pay a little bit and come, we will talk and we will listen to you. The guy, the problem we have today with gender, with LGBT, with the society with, which is very much Nobody trusts anyone which affects your capital, which affects your business, which affects actually the possibility to get more, starts with the fact that we forgot about the motion. So I think that your capital should be important and should be taken into consideration, but not just put along. It's not, it's not fully true that we can say that capital is all that matter, because it's not, because you will start if you, even if you want to take capital, you have to remember that people need to feel dignified and they need to feel safe. And if you take this away from them, you will lose. So the capital will go somewhere else, but there are people who want to have that capital that they won't have it. I don't know if this answers your question, but... Okay, uh, there is another. Sorry, but one final question and then going to get Paddy. Thanks very much. I, I, that was really inspiring. And the, there's one thing that, that came up, and it's you mentioned it just now, I referred to it um, indirectly now, and Niels and Stan, um, this, this word empathy, standing in the shoes of. And, and I was just thinking when you were talking, because this thing of West and East, and now we have global North, global South, but, and we, we just seem to inhabit a world of dichotomy still. You know, it was from the Cold War, um, you know, where it's communism and capitalism, and when you talk about empathy, if you, and Stan said this in, in States of Denial, that being in the place of where, you know, where it happens to other people, but you can put yourself there, then you break this dichotomy because there's no kind of other, if you see what I mean. And, and I just think, I, I think it's a really important form of the first step perhaps to resistance, that ability, which is really difficult to do, to stand in the shoes of someone else. So it's neither sympathy nor antipathy, it breaks those, that kind of dichotomy, that bipolarization. And it, and it kind of brings it into a center. And I just think, it, I think it's really important what you said for, you know, in terms of that particular condition. So I just wanted to kind of end on that. But perhaps it's the last, if you understand what I'm getting at. It's, I do. It's the last thing you think about in terms of resistance. Because 
it's one thing that we're not actually encouraged to emphasize. This is not something that is part of our kind of political, economic, or even social uh, kind of relationships. So I, I, I was really pleased that you, you, you rested in empathy because I think it's got some massive kind of positive repercussions. And I think that this is not just Inglehart, and even if Cohen said it straight, but Niels did not set it straight. His work is a proof that that's what he was taking into consideration. And just also finishing positive, I think that the problem I was talking about, these are also a very positive sign. Because it doesn't mean that we didn't have those problems before. I mean, it doesn't mean that LGBT were not treated unequally. It doesn't mean that women were not treated as a second second citizens and not unimportant people and all the others. But this was silent. It was not bring up and it did not have a name. Now it is named, now it's recognized as a problem. It's just that it's having a lot of clashes to go ahead. And it's just that it might destroy a bit our legal system. But empathy is extremely important and I, I would love to finish with that, although I need that we need also with empathy. It's not just that I empathized. I have to act. So that's what I would stress strongly, that we have to act. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.